Hi there, I am so excited to introduce you all to Leslie Fleming. She is a horticultural therapist that I've known since almost the day I moved to Florida when she very kindly invited to me to participate in the uh, network group at that time and come down and meet people and give some uh, presentations to the group. And it was really a wonderful way for me to learn about Florida a little bit, but also learn about what was going on in Florida in terms of horticultural therapy. Leslie has been very active in the field for a very long time, and she is a registered horticultural therapist. She has been working in private practice in horticultural therapy for quite some time, and she's worked with a lot of different populations, which is really wonderful. She's worked with um, in incarcerated individuals, with older adults. She's worked with people with dementia and those with physical disabilities, among others. Um, she's also been very active in Canada and has played a really leading role in terms of bringing horticultural therapy and really getting it up to speed there in Canada. She does a lot of presentations there. She's written a lot of things over there. And um, recently she's been involved in establishing a horticultural ther therapy network in Nova Scotia, which by the way, she is Canadian. <laughs> you may notice that in her voice as you listen to her. Um, she's also written a lot of things. She's had a lot published in the um, Journal of Therapeutic Horticulture, at least five articles. And she's also written a really wonderful book called um, Therapeutic Horticulture, a Practitioner's Perspective. And I've included a link to that on our website. So I really suggest you go take a look at that. It's an ebook, so it's easily accessible. Um, what else? I also wanna tell you that Leslie uh, was awarded the very prestigious Rhea McCandless Award from AHTA in 2018. And that's a professional service award. It's a really important award that um, recognizes people that have put a lot of service into the profession. So that's great. Um, she has been a board member on the AHTA Board of Directors. She also was the editor-in-chief of the news magazine for quite some time. And during her editorship, it really became much, much more professional magazine. So that was very exciting to see. And she served as the president of the Florida chapter of AHTA when there was one. And of course, I'm always hoping that she will get that going again, because I think it would be really wonderful for us to have a chapter here in Florida. We're seeing that many of our students are from Florida all over the state. So I'm hoping that before too long, we can get a chapter going again. Let's see, Leslie, is there anything I've forgotten to say? Oh, that's like way too much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's okay. get to the meat of the talk. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you some questions and just to try to get a sense. And, and the reason we're here is because, as I said, Leslie has a lot of experience in professional uh, private practice. And so I wanted to ask her some questions so you all could really get a sense of some of the things that she has to think about, some of the things she has experience with um, in that area. So let's just start by, um, could you describe what a typical day in a private practice would be that would include kind of the uh, actual session that you might deliver? Certainly, certainly. I think maybe the opening that I should begin with is my little acronym here. I think you can see that F-E-E-T. And to me, these are the basic um, tenants that a private practitioner needs. F stands for flexibility. E stands for you have to engage the clients. The second E, you have to be entrepreneurial if you're in private practice. And the T represents training. You really can't do anything without that foundational knowledge experience you're going to gain. And there are several ways to do that, which I'm sure we'll touch on. But I think that's maybe a good starting point. Now, in terms of a typical day in private practice, I'd like to say that there are several forms. One is a contractor where you work with organizations and they hire you as for your private practice. And the other is a consultant. And these two are not mutually exclusive. Often we will do both or we'll be hired to do one, which will then lead to the other. So the consulting activity really focuses on just that advising, consulting, not delivering actual programs. And there is a distinction, although for many of us, we do join both of those at the same time. Um, there are different types of models that we're going to participate in as private practitioners. Some of us would be delivering programs at greenhouses, maybe with a vocational focus. Others are garden-based activities where we would be working in gardens primarily. The ones that I delivered are what is typically referred to as tabletop, and that's usually delivered 
at a table, typically inside, with a variety of therapeutic goals, activities, and modalities that are plant-based, and entertaining. And I'm not going to focus too much on entertaining, but that relates to how we engage and interact with our clients, which is really the bottom line that we're doing. So sometimes the programs that we deliver are a one-time activity or event. Sometimes they're weekly. We'll go into that a little bit more, but there really isn't one model. So I guess maybe let me talk to your question, Lee, you know, what is a typical day? And really, there is no typical day. What we might do is structure our schedule based on the facilities or populations that we're working with. But we have to be flexible in modifying those when we arrive or as we're planning the programs. So I think maybe one way for me to answer this and for emerging professionals to think about this is there's kind of three phases prior to delivering a typical day of therapeutic horticulture or horticultural therapy. And the three phases are the pre-planning phase. The second phase would be delivering the program. And then the third phase is what you do after. So let me speak a little bit about that. Pre-planning includes reminding the facility or setting up the, the program and then reminding the facility of the date, the activity, the goals. It also includes gathering resources, preparing an invoice, and then arriving to do the setup. And typically for me, that would be 15 minutes prior to the delivery of the session, unless I had outstanding issues that I had to consult with or whatever. So then the second part of your typical day is actually delivering the program. And sometimes we would deliver the same activity several times to different groups. One key point that I'd like to stress is we have to be disciplined and conclude on time. And that relates not only to the attention span of the people that we're working with, but often other activities will be using the same space. So we have to be respectful really as private practitioners that we're invited in, invited in to work with certain clients into certain spaces. And then the third phase is um, the wrap up which includes interacting with facility contact, just saying, you know, the session went well, there were some challenges, goodbye, whatever. Um, we also document outcomes. So some of this would be done offsite after we leave, or sometimes we write these outcomes in our car, um, just when they're fresh in our mind. Um, we evaluate or identify problems as well as the positives, what went well. We record the numbers. And then really important, we have to leave the space as we found it. That sounds kind of, um, I don't know, of course you would do that, but I have to say, Conversely, we like to arrive at a space that's not scattered and, you know, the way that we need it to work. So a typical activity for how I did therapeutic horticulture, as I said, was tabletop. Sometimes I delivered it in outside gardens. Um, typically, the participants would number anywhere from four to 12. And we would sit around the table to do a hands-on plant-based activity. And some of the activities that I would do, tussie mussy, which is a small bouquet, planting onion bulbs, eating an orange, and then composting in a garden hole that I had pre-dug. And that would include walking through the garden, so building in a physical component. Um, one very popular activity was making Olympic halos out of rosemary. So, um, you know, one of the really neat things about being a private practitioner is we look at what the health um, goals are of the group that we're working with based on input from the facility. And then we have usually a lot of flexibility in choosing the activity, which personally I found very creative. Um, ideally, we're going to deliver more than one session at the same or different facilities on the same day to try and be efficient with our time and resources. It's easier to gather resources, you know, for several activities, but that doesn't always happen. So that's kind of a overview of what a typical day when I was delivering therapeutic horticulture looked like. That's great. That's really helpful. And it, I would imagine that in order to do all of that successfully, you need to be pretty organized. So is, I know you, because I know you, you're naturally a pretty organized person, but um, do you think that that sense of organization, would you agree that that was pretty important? very important. And I think that especially as a private practitioner, 
Um, you know, you aren't going to have the same infrastructure or the same boss breathing down your neck. You typically um, devise your own forms, create your own schedule. So yes, you have to have a good framework um, depending on the frequency of when you're delivering the programs. Typically, I would plan a month, even two months out, whether I was delivering programs once a week or four times a month or whatever. And then yes, you have to, you know, sometimes you think, oh, I'm going to work with onion bulbs and then you can't source them. So you really do have to be organized. You have to do things ahead. You also have to be flexible. Um, you know, as I said, for a whole lot of reasons, maybe you think you're having 10 people show up and this happened to me when I was working on the Naples Botanical Garden and uh, the invite went out for people who were participating with Lighthouse, which is an organization for people with visual impairments and lo and behold, like 25 people showed up. So yeah, we had to pivot a bit and I can't say that was probably the smoothest delivery of programs <laughs> I've ever done, but again, that training gives Gives you the foundation for for your ability to deal with changes. Yeah, makes sense. So I just want to ask you about you mentioned a couple of times about the um, importance of talking with the the facilitators or maybe administrators at the facility that you, you that have brought you in um, in terms of understanding some of the needs that the particular group might have. Have you found that that's a fairly easy process? And I'm sure it's different at different facilities, but would you often have to pull out that information or are they ready to provide the kinds of goals or the um, things they have in mind that your, your session will achieve? Right, I would describe it as collaborative. And I think that's the ideal as well as the practical. So we as horticultural therapists, we know that we are going to identify goals, identify an activity, look towards the outcome and then measure those, whether it's clinically focused in delivering horticultural therapy, or we still use that same process, so same steps if we're delivering therapeutic horticulture. So we have that mindset, that framework when we begin working or discussing with the facility. They would typically know their own population, but many are not, and this is one of the disadvantages of our professional field, are not familiar with horticultural therapy is. So in a discussion, and let's face it, we don't have an hour to talk to them about what we can do. We have to very quickly listen to what they have, what they think their needs are, look at what their facilities are, and then make some suggestions. And again, we can do some pre-planning for this, but a lot of times it's on the fly. And so, you know, we work with elders. Well, we know typically that they're going to have hearing loss, vision impairment. They're probably not getting as much intellectual stimulation. They're going to have some mobility problems. So we go into those initial meetings and every session that we deliver, recognize that. So as a practitioner, we have to have some idea of how to lay out what we think we can do for that program or that facility. And um, yeah, it's a give and take for sure. And if you're not listening, then you probably have no business being there. If you can't respond, and oftentimes you can't respond on the spot. We, you know, I'm going to listen to what their population is, and then I'm going to make some suggestions, and I'm going to probably follow up that initial meeting with some written information. Whether they read it or not, I don't know, but you know, that's another key skill that we have as private practice practitioners or HT practitioners, we have to be effective in our communication, written and verbal. And so I think that's probably how we start off. That said, I would say that as we work through different sessions, again, we're going to collaborate and modify what we're doing. Oh, it turns out that we're having more people with mobility impairments and it is easier or more efficient, more optimal to have the hands-on activity done seated at a table, we would like to walk through the garden. So how can we incorporate that? Maybe we can't do it in session one, but maybe we can figure out how to break that group into smaller numbers for those who do want to go out into the garden. So again, that's that flexibility that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And, and I think what you keep saying, which is so important, is that the, if you've got a solid training in horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticulture, then you, as you said, you know what some of the general issues are for particular client groups so that you can approach whether it's the meeting or the actual sessions. And I think that really is important and understanding 
not just some of the issues, but like you said, some of those questions to ask that really, that really is key. Right. I think another key point, Lee, that I would like to include is um, you have to determine who the decision maker is. And so you may meet with someone initially and yes, they think they like the idea and that might be say the executive dir uh, director of a facility, but then you're passed on or given a contact with somebody who's doing activities or, or whatever. And um, there is quite large turnover at most of the facilities that I've worked at, whether it's a boys and girls club or at a skilled nursing facility. And so you always have to keep your eye on who is making the decisions. And that relates to setting up the program, making sure the space is there, problem solving, being paid, let's face it, that's part of it. And, um, you know, other challenges, because I think we all want to deliver quality programs. And if there are some snafus, or we see things that we can improve, then we have to know who can make those decisions, who we can go to. That makes a lot of sense. And that's a great segue into asking, how do you typically find a site to work with? You know, how do you secure that, that location. Um, what's that process? Right. Um, and this process, some people love, some private practitioners loathe. And uh, I guess the key word is marketing, marketing, marketing. You have to market constantly. Um, related to that, I would say you have to have an effective elevator speech. You have to be able to convey what you can do in HT or TH in like three minutes or less to get your foot in the door. Then you have to have some materials um, that can document what the health benefits are. I think the development of our profession, it's not as easy for us to um, be understood as to what the benefits of our uh, profession is. And so, you know, we're always doing that. But um, a few tips that I would share with your um, students. One is I had the elevator speech and I had the documents. Typically, I use the University of Florida publication on HT. Oh, because I really like the authors. <laughs> and by the way, just I know that our students have read that, but Leslie helped us write that. She and I wrote it together with somebody else. And as a matter of fact, we need to rewrite that. So <laughs> Right, so I have those. Um, I had references, verbal as well as hard copy from other facilities where I delivered programs. And I often went in with that initial meeting with a plant gift, and that could be, usually was an activity um, item that we would be doing in a typical session. So that would be a tussie mussy or maybe a small transplant of a plant and uh, something that they would set on their desk. So that would remind them in the next couple of days that I had been there. Um, I think another key piece is that you have to be engaging with whoever you're talking to. And so even if we are not typically humorous, which I wouldn't describe myself as, we can still be engaging and enthusiastic because really that's what you're going to be bringing to the facility along with your expertise. Um, one of the other things that I conveyed to the contact was I would say to them, you know, here's my offer. Let's do three sessions. And after three sessions, if your clients or participants don't love, love, love the activities, okay, the decision is made, the market has spoken, but I'm totally confident in my skills and my activities that the people that you want to engage, I can engage with the hands-on plant activities. In terms of making the contacts, um, sometimes you make contacts ahead, sometimes we use cold calls. I tried to always speak with the most senior person at a facility, an executive director, um, an activity director, I have to say, not usually anyone in a PT or OT department, their staff, um, they often at um, many of the facilities are in their own departments. And though we within our field call them allied health professionals, and they are, they function differently and independently. And I'm not sure that the, the recognition of horticultural therapy has been fully embraced within those departments. And so they were not typically the context that I made um, in different communities that might be different. 
but again, we want to find out who the decision makers are. You have to sell yourself. You have to identify the health benefits of HT and TH. You can't be too deal detailed, but it has to be relevant, particularly to the population at that facility. And um, you know, I think again, be enthusiastic and a bit of an entertainer. You know, within the field, I think we can say that to one another. But if you, you know, have had the chance to shadow some HTs, you'll see that there is an essence to how we engage. And often it's not monotone and being, you know, really dry. And the same goes with marketing. I found some possible sites um, through word of mouth, through referrals at sister facilities, research, you know, how many senior facilities or youth centers are there in your community? What other types of programming are they doing? So you have to get a sense of what that market is. So, you know, I think that's probably, I'm not sure there's a typical way to find, but those worked for me. And I think probably for a fair number of other private practitioners. Great. And I would think just as if you're a graduate from college and you're on your way looking for a job and you're doing interviews, one of the most important things is to do your homework about the company that you're interviewing for. So exactly. likewise, you need to do some homework on that particular facility. You know, what are, what are the, what's their mission statement and what are some of the things that are valuable to them? And exactly. the students have been doing a lot of work on developing mission statements, developing um, program goals and things like that. So that would be really important to determine at that particular facility. Right. One of the things that's really easy to do, especially if you're delivering programs in an area, and this ties into marketing all the time, go into the facility. Some are secure and, you know, you can't walk around, but typically you can go into the reception area. And so you can get a sense of the layout. Typically the facility will have a activity schedule or calendar and so that will allow you to see if they have other programs like pet therapy or music therapy and so if they have those then you're going to have a sense that the administrator probably has a little bit of understanding about therapeutic programming and if not you know, then you may tailor your elevator speech to that but I think that's again part of the research. Okay. And how important do you think word of mouth is in terms of you being able to either get in to talk to somebody at a facility or, um, you know, that you're, it's, it helps with your credibility? Do you find that in some of these kinds of facilities, they know each other and they might, yes. um, you know, that, that helps? Yeah, for sure. Word of mouth is, you know, the, the golden apple for sure. Um, and I did get a fair number of programs where one facility would um, introduce me at their sister facility, sometimes in a community that was not like in Tampa per se, but um, just outside of the Tampa area. Um, if you're working with facilities like Brookdale Living that has a zillion different facilities, again, you, you have to be outgoing and ask them, can you please introduce me? Who is a contact person at your Sun City Center facility? How many facilities do you have in Carrollwood neighborhood? And some of these larger senior entities or hospitals for that matter, they have multiple sites. And so that is a wonderful th thing to as an introduction. Now, conversely, I have to say that if there have been some challenges, it can work in the opposite direction. That, you know, if you've delivered a bad program or there have been some safety issues that have been overlooked, that word of mouth can go in the opposite direction. But I think with, again, the training that we have, we know the best practices, we know the standards of practice, we know the safety protocols, and we do want to engage with the clients that we're working with. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. But, you know, again, you're not going to, and my husband shared this with me, not every facility and person that you work with is going to be a good customer. And so we have to be prepared for that. Even though I feel I may have delivered a good program and I dealt with whatever the issue was, the person that I'm working with at the facility or the client themselves may not feel that same way. And you may not get a choice or a chance to resolve it or improve. So you have to be prepared for both the pros and the cons. That's a very good point. Okay. Um, 
so you mentioned earlier on about paperwork, you know, you might have your own paperwork and you're sitting in your car after the session, you know, doing writing some evaluations or some some kind of report. Do you find that usually that's up to you whether you want to do that or not as a practitioner? Do you ever have a situation where the facility asks you to fill out particular paperwork that might be something that they use? I, it both. And I think, again, that's a question or a discussion that you would have usually at your initial meeting. They would say, you know, this is typically the information we want. I would say more often I devised my own forms because I was not required to do this because I was delivering therapeutic horticulture, so less clinical documenting. But I found that particularly for programs where I was working with the same clients from session to session, that allowed me to refresh my memory as to what a particular individual's challenges or, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, needs were. Excuse me. And, oh. <coughs> Excuse me, maybe you can edit this out. <coughs> um, so the forms, you know, I think that can take time. And some of us, you know, maybe we want to not spend the time on that. That ties into how you set your fee and how you use your time for that fee. You know, if you're going to spend an hour documenting information and you're only being paid for an hour by the facility, well, then you're probably not using your resources or earning a living as best you can. Um, but I think, you know, it's good to put some reporting in writing, whether it's requested or not, because that provides another opportunity for us to demonstrate our expertise. And one of the ways that I did this, going back to the pre-planning before I ever arrived to deliver a session, I would have a form, and usually I sent it digitally, with what the um, date was, the activity, what the goal was, what we expected the outcomes to be. And so then I can go back after I'm evaluating the program and maybe use that same form or modify it and identify in reality what the outcomes were different than what I projected them to be. So, um, you know, I think it, it really depends on what the practitioner is willing to do, what the facility wants, how you're going to deliver the best program, um, you know, so if they want it and it seems to improve your program, then I think you probably do want to spend some time on it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I think you're absolutely right. One of the most important pieces of that, even if it's not required, is that you can then show documented evidence of, right. you know, how you've been successful, or even if it's not about being successful, how many people that you've served and yes, you know, exactly. how long you've been serving and things like that. So I think right. that's really important. Yeah, I think the last couple of books um, that Rebecca Haller and her team have edited provide really good forms. So, you know, at this point in the profession's stage of development, you probably don't have to develop a lot of forms. You can probably go through the books that really are the textbooks of our discipline and find the forms. Um, peers, your co workers, your peers, you know, if you ask them for forms, they probably will share those with you. But I found for my own programs, it was just as fast and it worked better for me to really develop my own forms. And I found that it's maybe a combination that you find some forms that you think are good, but aren't quite right. So then you can modify them. And mm -hmm. um, that's that can be helpful as well. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of answered this question already. But um, I'm wondering, you know, we talk a lot about in the courses, the assessment of clients, trying to get a sense of um, who you're working with and uh, ahead of time before you start to design some activities. And, you know, you've said that you need to kind of go in and have a, a good sense of that general client population um, because you may not have a chance to pre-assess clients or, you know, people in that group. Do you find that that's generally true? Is there any opportunity for you to assess the group before you actually start programming with them? Not usually. And, you know, there's several factors that um, relate to this. One is if you're delivering therapeutic horticulture, then you probably do not have access to the confidential medical information. And as a contractor, facilities are not likely to share that with you. You can try and write that in your contract with them that they provide access. Um, but, you know, a lot of times that's 
you know, just not going to happen. So, um, you know, I think that is one option to try and get the medical records. If you've had a chance to shadow or in some facilities, I've asked if I can come and observe another activity. So I get a sense of how they use their space, what their timing is like, who, what the population is that you're working with, then you're going to be reading all of those cues and you'll have a better sense. Um, and again, I typically went to my car and I would write down some notes so that two weeks later, or a month later, when I'm back at that facility, it's going to refresh me. I mean, if we're delivering 20 or 40 or whatever number of programs, okay, maybe I'm saying this because I'm in my 60s, I'm not going to remember all the details that I want to remember as a practitioner. So, um, you know, I think that's probably a good practice to get into. Um, assessing the clients before we start programming. Another factor, this costs money. It costs a private contractor money to spend time doing that, although I think it's important to do that, um, particularly, again, if you're working with the same clients. If it's a facility or an event where you're going to be working with different participants each time, you, you know, you probably, that's probably not a smart use of your time, and you're probably not going to have the opportunity opportunity to do that. But, you know, I think you have to be observant, you have to look at who is at the facility, what facilities are being used. Um, again, you have to be familiar with some populations, and um, what you will expect their behavior, their moods, their functioning abilities to be. And, um, you know, I think that's probably the most important for me because I didn't have the chance to assess clients before I actually started working with them, which is understanding the, the population you're working with, asking the facility staff questions before you start. As I mentioned, sometimes you can shadow at a facility. And I think interning, which we haven't talked about yet, um, that gives you another sense or an opportunity to understand the broader picture and to understand the population. So I think that's probably more important for a private practitioner than access to medical um, information. Okay, that's very helpful. So I want to ask you one more question and then we'll take a break and I okay. think we'll come back for a second part and talk more about some of the logistics but and this is the tough question but I know the question that everybody wants to know how do you decide what to charge and how you know a particular facility are you charging by the hour by the session does it change from one facility to another to another what kind of advice can you offer emerging professionals Right. Um, I think that you have to be familiar with what your market will withstand. And so you have to get that information from peers, whether they're in your community or somewhere else. Um, you have to try and determine what other activity professionals or therapeutic professionals are charging. Um, uh, you know what, I always approach it as an, again, a collaborative open discussion with the facility. I typically had a sense of um, they will be willing to pay between X and X, and I've got to fall somewhere within that. And, um, you know, I work with them on that. Um, one of the programs that I delivered at an assisted living facility, it was a not for profit. So I knew that they didn't have a lot of funding. And so while I feel and advise that it's really important that you charge something, um, that program for me was half community service, so I wasn't charging them the same amount. Um, there are pay scales out there, and again, that's where networking within the HT profession, we're going to get a sense of, you know, you're not going to charge $25 an hour for a session, that's too low, nor are you going to charge $500 an hour, that's too high. Certain markets, as I said, like New York, Denver, Chicago, um, they're larger communities, they are hiring more private contractors within a range of therapeutic modalities, and so they're going to be more comfortable with spending more. Smaller communities are not going to be as comfortable with that. Um, one of the things that I found effective was that I had one set fee. And so even though in my own mind, I'm thinking about, okay, for me to plan and deliver this program, and it's an hour session, is going to take me five hours or whatever, one hour of delivery time and you know, two hours of prep, one hour after, and I have to source the materials, 
I'm thinking in terms of that in addition to the materials fees. And then for ease of the facility and understanding it, I would say, you know, I'm going to charge $150 for a one hour session for up to 12 participants, all materials included. And I think that was much easier for them. They didn't want to know the details of how much those plants cost. They didn't want to know I had to buy two bags of soil. You know, that was just too much detail. And I think if you think of it in terms of, again, you're invited in as a contractor and you are competing with others, you know, much of their focus is on their full time staff. You've got to make it as easy and as efficient as possible and deliver the goods. So, you know, fees. Yeah. One last point that I'd like to share is once that fee is set, they don't like to change it. So it's really hard to increase it. Um, you know, if I'd been delivering a program for three quarters of a year, I might start the discussion with my contact person, you know, there's going to be a fee increase and kind of gauge their reaction and gauge whether it was important to me to keep at the facility. I mean, if it was a fourth program and a day that I wanted to have four programs, then maybe I didn't charge them the same amount. But, you know, keep in mind that within, um, a corporate entity, they're going to know what you're charging. Um, sometimes I did charge more for memory loss facilities um, because I felt that that took a little bit more expertise and um, the numbers weren't as large. But, you know, again, they're going to probably look at market value and we have to be on top of that as well. Okay, that's very helpful. And I, what I hear you saying is that you're going to calculate your number of hours that you're putting into a particular session, but you're more likely to charge a fee for the session yes. rather than by the hour. Okay, exactly. And I think you have to take into account not only your time, but you know, if you're a private contractor, you're not getting health benefits. Um, you know, you have to take into account transportation costs, material costs, and so it's a little bit more complicated than if you're employed by a facility to deliver horticultural therapy. Some people, this is for them. They don't mind doing that. It's, you know, easy for them or they're willing to put that time in and it becomes a bit of a formula that then, then apply to their programs. Other people, they just have no idea how to do that. P.S. It's okay to ask others for help, whether they're in HT or in business or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, Leslie, great. this has been fantastic. I think this is a lot of great information. I'd like to take a break here and then we'll do a part two where we kind of talk to you about some of the logistics and okay. the different kinds of things that come along with private practice. So awesome. thank you and we will see you all soon. Okay, thank you.